Hey everyone, I'm Steve Sparacher of Fire the Mind Design, and because there's no one reviewing anything on YouTube, this is Book Burning Reviews, a series about books on design, design thinking, creativity, and design research. And today we set it off appropriately enough with Design Thinking by Nigel Cross. <laughs> Before we talk about design thinking, a few words about its author. Nigel Cross is an Emeritus Professor of Design Studies at The Open University, President of the Design Research Society, and Editor-in-Chief of the Design Studies Journal. He began his career in design research in the 1960s with early reverse turning testing. But in 1982, he gained notoriety for his paper Designerly Ways of Knowing, which was a response to papers from Archer and Neelan, which seek to establish a theoretical basis for design as an area of study. Designerly ways of knowing focused on the idea of design as a third culture of knowledge alongside science and the humanities, and like them should be part of general education. Design Thinking was published in 2011, and today we're going to be looking at the 2013 Bloomsbury Publishing reprint. <laughs> Design Thinking is split into eight chapters and is a relatively short book coming in at just under 150 pages of content. The bulk of the book relies on case studies with demonstrate aspects of good design thinking. Designers highlighted include the Bradham Formula One chief designer, Gordon Murray, Pentagram co-founder, Keith Grant, and engineering designer, Victor Slemon. The opening chapter introduces us to theories on and methods of research in design thinking. This is followed by two chapters with studies on Murray and Graham, respectively. The fourth chapter compares and contrasts the methods used by the two. The chapter following that is on Victor Slemon, then a chapter on design team at work, then a chapter comparing and contrasting the previous two chapters. The final chapter leaves us with observations and findings from his research as well as the research of others. This book begins with the proposition that all humans can, and in fact do, design. To trace the history of design, we would have to go all the way back into prehistory and examine our earliest tools and processes, because everything humans make is designed. The concern of this book, and of design thinking research in general, is to understand why some people are better designers than others. What makes a great designer better design than the average person? Researchers in design thinking have a few methods for understanding how designers think. These include interviews of designers, observations in case studies, experimental studies, simulations, reflections, and theorizing. Cross doesn't spend much time on the simulation method, which he characterizes as a relatively new development in research methodology has been the attempt of artificial intelligence researchers to simulate human thinking. I'm glad that he didn't focus on this method, as I'm skeptical that a computer can think like a human, but that is a debate for another day. One thing that Cross is skeptical of is any method which relies on taking designers at their word. One of the minor reasons is that some people think that designers can be, let's say, less than humble. Uh, that's not my opinion, but there is a more substantial reason. More importantly, many people are not aware of or cannot remember what they've done in the design process. Design requires abductive reasoning. Now, abductive reasoning is a lesser known form of reasoning than inductive or deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is logic derived from general principles that forms arguments or formulas. It's the kind of reasoning we associate with mathematics or with philosophy. Deductive reasoning is based on observational evidence. It's the kind of reasoning which we associate with science. But design is concerned with manifesting objects that do not yet exist. It can't be derived from inductive logical principles, and it's not something which we can observe in the world, because design is focused on finding solutions to problems we find in the world. Whether or not we would be better able to 
explain our abductive reasoning if it was part of our general education is not clear. One thing that Cross thinks may be clear, though, is that we could deconstruct the abductive reasoning process of designers by watching what they do. And this is the method that he's going to use in most of the book. He's going to look to interviews and to design artifacts and derive, as well as his own observations, to try and derive characteristics, commonalities, principles, traits, relationships about designers. When he's talking about Gordon Murray and he's going to his case study on Gordon Murray, he focuses on how Murray was able to get the competitive edge for his team by looking to innovations in an unrelated field, specifically looking to innovations in the medical industry and in filter systems used in the medical industry and thought about how he'd introduce them into his vehicle. When talking about his design process, Murray states that I do a quick sketch of the whole idea and if there's one bit that looks good, instead of rubbing other bits out, I'd put that bit to one side. I'd do it again and expand on the good bit and drop out the bad bit and keep doing it, doing it, and end up with all the sketches. And eventually, you end up throwing 90% of these away. Murray starts by rubbing out sketches till he has a good idea. And then he rubs out that good idea until completely spent. Because design is not idea efficient. And if you want to be a designer, you're going to have to deal with a lot of idea waste. Now turning our attention to Graham, we focus on how Graham was tasked with designing a sewing machine and how he used his own experiences using a sewing machine as a starting point. Saying, I chose to use it, actually making things with a sewing machine. So I did fairly quickly come to understand just fundamental strengths and weaknesses. Designers can't be detached from the things that they're designing. The fastest way for Grant to understand the machine and to understand how users interact with the machine was to become a user himself. The same chapter discusses Grant's involvement with the British high-speed rail trains. And this was a case where Grant went well beyond his initial design brief. Initially, Grant was tasked with designing the exterior paint job for the trains. But Grant wanted the paint job to emerge naturally out of the function of the train. So he worked with an aerodynamicist and they designed different noses for the trains and test them in a wind tunnel. Now, unsurprisingly, not everyone was happy with his results, but this is a book about thinking and not about working with clients. The point is that Grant found a way of engaging with his subject even when he didn't have direct access to it. One thing that Cross notes is the different motivations given by both Murray and Grant behind their thinking about what they do. Murray is very competitive. He comes back again and again and he wants to overcome his competition and he wants to overcome himself. Grant thinks about things a little more playfully. He is, has a little more of a beginner's mind. He likes taking things apart. He likes putting them back together to understand how they function. Now one thing you might have noticed at this point is that we haven't discussed the idea of a spark of uh, genius. And that's because it doesn't seem to be centrally important to the process. What Cross does think is important to the process are three strategic aspects of design thinking, which he gives as one, taking a broad systems approach to a problem, 
rather than accepting a narrow prime criteria. The systems approach to design means that an item is designed within the context of how it will be used in relation to other items. Murray had to think about this when it came to making pit stops more effective. And if you understand how the railway system works, you can design a train for it. Two, framing the problem in a distinctive and sometimes personal way. Have a very distinctive understanding of the user. What are the general patterns of behavior from the user? Can you make those patterns more effective? How do you give them the most effective, the safest, the most pleasant, or the least distracting experience? The designers featured in the book felt personally motivated to help users in whatever way the project warranted. Three, design for first principles. This relates to the design's functions. Was the train more aerodynamic or not? Cross spends a great deal of the book unpacking these strategies, even when he doesn't explicitly say that's what he's doing. The next chapter is a protocol study with Victor Slemon, who walks us through his account of using a bicycle and thinks aloud his process for designing a bicycle. Cross then shows us how the strategies were used in that session. The chapter that follows that is in the same vein with a three-person design team designing a bicycle. The chapter focuses a lot on the collaboration between the team and how they present ideas, accept or reject those ideas, how they take on different roles, they avoid conflict, and the actual results that they come up with. Now in the pattern already established in the book, we have a chapter which examines those previous two chapters, which focuses a lot on collaboration, how the different roles that were taken on by people in the team. One role was taken of a manager who kept the project on task, while another participant took the role of being very detail-oriented and trying to get to concrete results, while the last person thought more broadly and tried to stop the team from deciding on results too quickly. Now, if you're an individual designer, you have to play multiple roles. So if you, in fact, see a designer scribbling away, muttering to themselves, know that, um, yes, they do have multiple personalities. The chapter also examines the amount of time spent on different processes. And if you're interested in how people move between different parts of the process, chapters 7 and 8 is really going to be helpful for you. Now, chapter 7 and 8 actually talks about students. And it's important for students to learn how to move fluidly through these different parts of the process. You want to be able to gather information, you want to have working sketches, you want to sort of hone in on your idea, you want to re-examine your information, you want to create working models in an effective manner. Uh, the causation is not clear, but it has been shown that if you're able to move quickly through this process in an effective manner, it will allow you to see things which are not as apparent. This, this final chapter also spends a lot of time talking about how designers change over as they gain more experience. So over time, experts actually change their thinking and their habits as they accumulate knowledge. The expert has years that it takes to get to that level. It takes years to become an expert. So this might not be a smooth transition either, as there can be punctuated equilibrium in the process. And this last chapter was one which I was a little unsatisfied with. Overall, I thought that the book was very succinct. And I liked that, but this last chapter came off like it was an abridged version of a longer work. This book is not how-to book, so if that's what you're looking for, this will not help you. 
in terms of general audiences, I think design thinking is a little too dry. So I can't recommend it on that level. In fact, I think that this cover design might be slightly misleading in that regard. The book doesn't assume that you have a background in qualitative research, but it doesn't hold your hand either. It just gives you the basics and assumes that you can keep up. There are a relatively small number of research subjects in the book, which some might see as a detriment, but I think makes the book more manageable as an introduction to the subject. It might work as a supplemental material to an upper level undergrad class. If anyone out there has actually used the book for this purpose, please let me know how that went in the comments below. And if you're particularly interested in learning more about the creative process, particularly if you're a researcher or you're head of a team, then Definitely, I would recommend that you get the book. You can buy in the link below. With the class of 2016 having just graduated, I think it'd be a good time to discuss Michael Janda's 2013 book, Burn Your Portfolio, stuff they don't teach you in design school, but should. So we will next time on Book Burning Reviews. So what do you guys think? Are you going to read Design Thinking? Have you already read Design Thinking? If you already read it, were there parts that I left out that you want to talk about let me know below subscribe if you uh, want to kiss the next episode and until then keep them fires burning